All right. Should we get started? Mm, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, hey, guys. You probably know this already, but I'm Bob Ack, and I'm joined by Ben and Raj. Ben, Raj, you guys want to give brief intros? Yeah. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm head of design for Brilliant Labs. And I'm Raj, head of engineering. All right. So uh, the three of us wanted to just do this AMA because a bunch of new people in the Discord, which is awesome. And I think early customers should have started receiving their monocle units, which is also super awesome. That's like a big milestone. So um, we're standing by to support and answer any questions. Um, nice. I'm glad you're pumped to get it. Uh, it's <laughs> coming. I promise it's coming. Um, the uh, uh, a couple of giveaway uh, uh, and other announcements before we get started with the question. So um, we we heard last week that a lot of folks were excited about the results of the giveaway, but perhaps not able to join this AMA. So if you can wait a couple of hours more, Lily, who is you'll you'll notice her as Brilliant Labs community um, in the Discord chat, she is going to announce over text so that it's it's fair for everyone. Everyone gets to actually see who won the giveaway at the same time. Um, I think some folks were concerned that they, they didn't get to see the results. So um, just bear with us a couple more hours. Lily be, will be awake in a few hours and, and she'll, she'll write that out to everyone. So, um, so that's the giveaway. Um, uh, we've got a big announcement toward the tail end of the call sort of a, a one more thing. So, you know, bear with us. Uh, we'll get through the AMA, kind of the Q&A stuff first, and then and then we'll make that announcement. Um, and yeah, I mean, before we get started, Ben, Raj, anything at the top that you guys wanted to to mention? Anything you guys wanted to, to kind of announce to folks? Or should we get to it? I think uh, get into it. Yeah. Any questions? Yep, definitely. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, well, using the chat here in the AMA, guys, you can just write to us your questions, and we'll try to uh, answer them as, as quickly as possible to try to make good headway on people's questions. Uh, it worked out well in the Reddit AMA, so hopefully mm -hmm. it will work out well here, too. Yep. Oh, we are using the general oh, yeah. channel for, for asking here, okay. Yeah, okay. you guys can ask now. Yep, go for it. Oh, that's the question. All right, so <laughs> I was just in our factory on Friday, so I've got a bit of insight into this. Um, we need the rest of Feb to get materials and factory time scheduled to do a larger ramp of production over March. So as you guys might know, factories take time to ramp um, production. We didn't expect to receive the influx of, of, of interest, um, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's a great problem to have, but uh, it happened a lot sooner than we thought. So um, our factory is kind of freaking out, um, saying, you know, come on, you know, we, we didn't know that we need to make so many so fast. So um, they can't, they're a bit like a cruise ship. They can't just turn on a dime. So what I've had them do is take the rest of the couple of weeks in, in February, get all the materials in order, train more people to be able to assemble monocle units. Um, and then in March, we're going to ramp production. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, we could probably do something between 50 to 100 over March. And then starting from April, we can do 100 to 200. And then starting in May, we can do, you know, something like 200 to 400. So there's going to be a steady ramp month on month. Um, we probably wouldn't want to go any higher than you know, two to 300 a month, if, you know, if, if we can, 
But of course, if things get you know crazy from the order side of things, then we'll just keep working with the factory to ramp. So your patience, much, much, much appreciated. We're working as hard as yeah. we can. This is a very complicated product to assemble. So uh, good question. All right, welcome for those who just joined, yeah, just a real quick welcome to the AMA. We're answering any of your questions. So throw them into the chat and we're standing by. Welcome, good to have you here with us. Hmm, use cases. This is a, this is mm. a very good question. It's a very popular question. question. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I can tell you, like, just in the last day, there were some a couple interesting use cases that people kind of threw at me that I was like, oh, yeah, that, that'd be great. But maybe, Ben, Raj, if you guys want to kick it off and offer some of your thoughts, and then I'll share what's on mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can go. Uh, I also mentioned these in the in the Reddit thread. I think we all have our sort of little pet projects that we want to do with Monocle. Like the thing that we personally want to use Monocle for. Um, and one thing I'm really excited about, I'm a huge tabletop game fan. So I love playing tabletop games, tabletop minis. Uh, so I want to make some kind of app that recognizes minis on the table and gives like like floating hitboxes or stats or information. Um, something like that. So yeah, at the moment I'm sort of brainstorming these ideas with my gaming group and uh, seeing, seeing what we can come up with. That's one of my pet projects. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a couple that we talked about on the last day, AMA that I'm particularly interested in. One, one was um, sort of like for, for tourists around the city or for yourself around the city for, for viewing local attractions. So um, using like GPS to find out where you are or um, computer vision to identify buildings and uh, landmarks, but having kind of uh, information fed to you about these buildings as you walk around the city that you're in or the, the place that you're visiting. Um, maybe even some audio notes about what you're, what you're looking at. But on, mm. on top of that, one of the, one of the super sort of like, like sci-fi things that I, I really like the idea of is um, viewing, uh, having Monocle show you old photos or old videos of the of the part of the town or city that you're in or visiting. I, I really like that idea. Um, I can get in, get in some insight into the the changes that have been made in that city uh, over time. So that's something I'm quite excited about. I love that as well. Yeah, giving you a sense of place wherever you are yeah. because you can see the past. Yeah, it's, it's um, been yeah, it's been on it's been on a lot of sci-fi stuff. Um, mm. That that kind of vision, like holograph mm. of the past, and I, I love, I really love that idea. I've been I just just being able to see what something uh, an area used to look like uh, fifty or hundred years ago. Yeah, and there could be um, oh cool, mm. and well. Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> Awesome. We'll check that out. Um, yeah, and there could be, you know, I could imagine with that use case that there could be kind of uh, multiple levels of complexity built in. So that could start with yep. just text, mm -hmm. you exactly. know, where you yeah. are, there's a text readout, and then you can, of course, go to simple images, and then, you, of course, you can go to more complex mm -hmm. animations. But, you know, you could start on that in simple ways. Yeah, and I love the idea of um, if 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 it's going to plot a journey for you through a, a new city or place you haven't been to before, sort of logging that day as well. So each place you visit, having like little notes um, sent over to the app um, on your phone, so you've got like a, a little log of where you, not only where you've been, but some like reading material about about each place, some information that you can you can catch up on later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So two use cases that came my way uh, in the last 24 to 48 hours. One came from uh, uh, TED, uh, the, the organization based in Brooklyn. I think they're based in Brooklyn, where people, you know, TED, we're all familiar with TED. People give mm -hmm. talks. Um, and they are looking for uh, a, 
a real-time transcription solution for people at their big conference. So, you know, wearing monocle people who have uh, hard of hearing, <clears throat> they could have a live audio to text transcription displayed right in front of their eye and mm -hmm. that, uh, that would be very, very useful. So that was one that came my way. Mm. Um, uh, and then the second was a museum uh, type of experience. So I was at the uh, museum earlier today with, uh, with my kids and we were with another family and, uh, you know, we got to talking and um, we kind of realized that looking at like objects and just like little kind of text to describe them could be transformed if you had a device that mm -hmm. would, you know, show you some contextual information about the thing floating next to the thing, maybe even like bring the thing to life, you know, especially if it's about a person or, you know, circumstance of history. Um, so, you know, there's lots of ways to bring museums to mm -hmm. life and make them more interactive um, than just kind of the stale object and like some little text thing below it. Um, so, so yeah, just two things for the last 24 hours, two things that came my way. And both of those should be fairly doable. Uh, there's, there's multiple ways. The, the, the first idea you had with, with this, uh, with the Ted talks, um, that could of course be sort of detecting, uh, audio and processing it on the FPGA and showing you the text. Um, but you could also get more context if the actual venue had uh, a Bluetooth beacon um, or sort of gateway that's actually advertising this data to all the monocles around. And so the monocles then yeah. getting some kind of curated information. Um, and then you can you can put all kinds of stuff in there. Very cool. Yeah, we should talk more about the 10 mm -hmm. one because yep. they're, they're serious about it and they can buy a whole bunch. Um, so ooh, we, should, we should talk about it. Yep. Um, I think we've got more questions coming in. Interesting Raj, question here. Yeah. Is it hard yeah. to brick the device? So this one sort of depends on how much you start tinkering with it. Um, if you're going to use MicroPython, um, it's, you shouldn't be able to brick the device. We've, uh, we've tested it to make sure that you don't end up in that kind of situation. Um, but if you start delving into the C code and building your own firmware from scratch, uh, there's a few things you have to watch out for. Um, specifically, uh, if you're messing around with any of the power settings. So the way the monocle hardware internally works, uh, just like how your computer has a power system, like a power delivery system for all the components such as the CPU. Uh, and if, if anyone's familiar with overclocking, you can turn the voltage up on the CPU. There comes a point where you put the voltage too high and things start blowing up. So we fine-tuned all of these voltage values uh, for each of the components that run inside Monocle. So you really shouldn't touch those. And we've labeled all of those and put them in a file that says critical. Uh, and there's a bunch of warnings around there. Don't touch this unless you really read thoroughly the data sheet, how it works. and um, if you have a few spare things on hand, uh, just be very careful. Um, so that's, that's one thing to watch out for. And if you're developing uh, C applications yourself, uh, you probably want to have um, a way to actually debug Monocle. So you want to actually have a J-Link or NRF52 DK uh, and actually be able to probe to the programming pins of the Monocle and be willing to take it apart so you don't end up um, messing up the Bluetooth and not being able to do an OTA. That could be quite common. So uh, that's the two things to watch out for. One is very pay very particular attention to the voltages. Um, and uh, if you're going to do C development, it's just good to have a hand like a dev kit around or a J-Link around to, to debug. And there's other debugging solutions out there. So check our docs for that. Um, and the battery life, Raj. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was actually, yeah, I was actually measuring um, the battery life last week. Uh, still, sort of early tests, um, but we've refined the firmware a lot. So now it's it's handling sort of the idle times better. It's uh, the Bluetooth is actually going to sleep when it should. Um, so it's a seventy milliamp hour battery inside Monocle, 
um, and the idle the idle power with the screen being on normally, all the pixels are drawing. Uh, the FPGA is on, but the camera is off. Uh, that is uh, 64 milliamps. So that's what I measured this uh, this week, and so that's that's roughly an hour, just over an hour actually. Um, and then the case has uh, it's a 450 milliamp power battery in the case, so that should give you around six charges, uh, something like that. Um, but if you turn the camera on, um, you you sort of it's, it's like doubling the uh, the current usage. And of course, the more you do on the FPGA, uh, the more processing you do, the faster you run the FPGA. Of course, it's gonna it's gonna take more current. Same with the Bluetooth. If you're constantly sending data, it's gonna take more current. So it, you'll have to experiment a little bit, but idle. Um, the 64 milliamp figure, that's the FPGA on. So that's the display on, uh, on normal brightness, and the FPGA on, um, and the color pattern that you might have seen in one of our YouTube videos. Uh, that is, that is uh, uh, being drawn to the display. So I have a monocle here. So in the state you see with the display being drawn. So low monocle. Yep. So that's about 64 milliamps from what I was, uh, what I measured at least. Uh, that might change as we, we change the firmware, but it's a ballpark figure at the moment. What uh, screen brightness is that? So right. I'll have to check the data sheet. There's, I think, four different screen brightnesses, um, and it's on the default brightness. Um, maybe Joshua knows off by off by heart. He's uh, he's spent a fair bit of time uh, looking at this, but otherwise, um, I can paste it in the chat later on. If default is medium. You can go higher and lower. Mm, yep. So I think there's well, two steps below be... and two steps above this. The brightness that is set. Yeah. As far as I remember. Maybe like 1500 nits. Mm. 1500 or 2000, yeah. something like that. Yep. That's yeah, still quite high. Great. The highest, I think the highest are two. If you didn't right. want to use the REPL, can you load MicroPython on it somehow? Um, so, the at the moment, the, the main interface we have is the REPL over Bluetooth. Um, just because there's no, there's no physical connection, um, there's no physical serial connection to Monocle. Um, normally, the MicroPython REPL is over a, UART, a serial UART connection, uh, but we've done over Bluetooth instead. You can actually build that REPL, as it doesn't have to be a web app, it could be a Python app, um, it could be another thing. Um, yeah, to store programs, that's something we're, we're actually going to start looking at soon. Um, for now, we've just kind of got the live REPL working, uh, but we're working, there is actually a, a f um, an embedded flash, a separate flash chip uh, inside the monocle, and we want to use that as the, as the storage for Python scripts. Um, so the standard MicroPython firmware that uses the on-chip flash, um, but we want to actually use that as the sort of feature space to actually put on um, all the MicroPython features and the actual, the, the sort of, um, the C application basically lives in there. Uh, and then actually use the, the off-chip uh, flash to store the applications. So we have to rebuild the standard MicroPython flash drivers, basically, the, all the file system stuff. So that, that is coming. Um, it's quite a fair bit of work to, to get this working, but it's on the roadmap. Not totally sure when it's going to be yet. There's a few things we want to get done first, um, but it will come. The FPGA, uh, storing the FPGA binary, um, sending that over Bluetooth, storing that, that's going to come first. Uh, and then we'll get on to, get on to actually storing the programs. Yep, that's correct. So if you store the, if you type out an application um, in the REPL, uh, as soon as you put Monocle back, back in the case and take it out again, it's forgotten everything. 
So that is, at the moment, you can't save your applications. Uh, your application has to be sort of delivered by something, uh, either a web app, a phone app, uh, a, a Python app on your computer or another app on your computer, um, or Bluetooth gateway or something like that. Yeah, so, oh, oh, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> just paste it in. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna quickly touch on that final one about the the REPL stuff. <clears throat> Could you do some kind of app app based REPL thing that reads Python code from your phone? So can use it headless. Yeah, so this is actually something where we're trying to map out as well. Um not just for uh monocle to read Python apps on a phone, but actually reach out to the cloud and get Python scripts, for example, from GitHub. Um, so something I'm experimenting with is uh, sort of like an API, sort of a, like, um, like a REST API interface type thing uh, that translates via a mobile, via the, the um, web REPL or running on a phone, uh, but it actually just pipes those um, commands like, uh, you know, just a re request uh, up to the cloud, get some information as JSON, brings it back. And then in there is your is your Python script, so something like that, um, definitely possible. And yeah, of course you can have a mobile app that delivers delivers arbitrary Python scripts. Uh, Monocle just sits there waiting for Python scripts, so a Python just lines of Python. So however you de deliver that, it will it will run those commands. Awesome. Should we move on to? The next, there's a block of questions. And so, are there any plans to launch several campaigns to raise the general awareness and awareness of this existence? Yeah. Are we doing any campaigns about that? <laughs> no. So basically, we we've, we've done no marketing, um, which which is which is kind of cool, I think. Um, and there's good reason for it. So, uh, number one, we genuinely want to understand based on just the merits of this device and how it resonates with people, um, what would be the viral coefficient or what would be the kind of sharing of news about this, of purchases, of, you know, things people build with this. So we really want to get a sense of that without muddying the waters with paid marketing, PR and advertising. Um, most of the good things that we all read about what other companies build, surprise, surprise, there's money involved. So, uh, you know, journalism has found its way to try to make money again. And fortunately, it's not so pure and honest. Um, we don't want to engage in that, at least not right now. Um, so uh, we really want it to be just off the pure merits of like, how someone might have stumbled across it or how a friend might have shared it with them um, and whether it resonates on some level enough for them to join our community here, start brainstorming ideas, things that they want to build with it, share it with someone else or maybe even purchase a unit. So that's that's one reason is we really want to get a hand in that. Um, the second reason is, uh, as you can tell, our factories, I mean, again, I'm saying at the beginning of the call, this device is, so Monocle is very complex to assemble. And factories are scrambling to ramp production, literally train more people to be able to assemble it. Um, so if we did a bunch of advertising so that more people knew about this uh, product and our company, then our fear is that there would be a lot more customer orders coming in. Um, and we just would be unprepared to meet that, which wouldn't be good. So uh, it's coming, but, but not yet. Um, so in the meantime, we're trying to do more organic marketing, like, you know, AMAs on Reddit to just, you know, we human beings show up on Reddit, interact with other human beings, and maybe they share that with other human beings in the universe. Like, you know, we're just trying to keep it really, really humble, really organic, um, you know, pretty high touch. Um, and then over time, we'll, we'll kind of scale that, but not yet. Um, okay, and I see a, a few more questions too. Dedicated budget. 
uh, yeah, so hopefully I answered that. We're just, it's not something that we're doing yet. Um, you have a larger target audience except hackers and tinkerers. If no, will selling only them make enough profit to carry on? So uh, profit depends on cost in a sense. We are profitable on the unit economic level. Um, and as a company, we have a very clear path to profitability because our burn rate is quite low. So I know we're just like a couple people running this thing. So um, our, our burn rate is not that high as a company. So the short answer on profit is even if we just sold it to developers and hackers, yes, there is a clear path to profitability. Um, but to the first part of your question, uh, yeah, I mean, I think over time, and I think, you know, based on what you see, we announced at the end of the call, um, part of our hypothesis is that we can do a platform that is open and developer accessible, and that that's not dichotomous with ongoing miniaturization and beautiful devices that anyone would want to buy and wear. That typically these things have been treated as separate from each other. Mm -hmm. If you do one, you can't do the other. Um, we think that's a false dichotomy. So yeah. uh, the products that we do over time are going to continue to bring these things together. So beautiful things that people want to own and wear, even if they're not a developer. And at the same time, a richly open and capable development platform that is unlike any other that developers can sink their teeth into. So, so the answer is yes, we have a larger target audience of mine, but the roots of that tree are definitely developers and hackers. Mm -hmm. All right. We got doc shared. No worries. Happy to answer it. Go ahead and ask any questions you guys have. All right. Um, how far along are the glasses version? Should we go ahead and do it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Should we yeah, share? Go for it. Um, I guess what? Well, so we've been sharing little little photos of this for the last mm -hmm. few weeks now. I think Bob actually shared one a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, we are working on a, a pair of frames, Woo. which we're very excited about. Um, and we want this product to sort of sit sit alongside Monocle. Um, so for, for people that don't don't wear eyewear, then this would be the, the product that you would purchase. Um, and then if you wear eyewear, you can you can purchase Monocle. So yeah, we, we're super excited about this. Um, one of the main, um, one thing that we have managed to sort of um, slightly improve on in Monocle is the size of the prism. So on Monocle, um, the prism is uh, nine millimeters thick uh, we've managed to reduce that to six millimeters and that is the primary reason why we've been able to actually um, develop these because it's just about the right size now uh, we'd love it to be thinner but we the, the test displays that we've got so far look really really good um, so we think uh, yeah this is a kind of a perf perfect sort of size to develop the frames it will still be only one-sided uh, heads-up display. One side will have optics in. One side will just be a clear, clear lens. And then um, it will follow very much similar features that we have in, in Monocle. Um, open source, using MicroPython to create your own um, apps and features. So yeah, we're, we're very excited about this. We're experimenting at the moment with 3D printed frames. So these, these frames are they use SLS sintering process to make. We're experimenting with this as a as a sort of um, commercial release as well, where we would use the printed frames to to ship to people. Um, these guys, material verse, right, Bob? Materialize. 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 They work with a number of eyewear companies to produce three D printed frames, and there's a few advantages to this in the we could offer different sizes and potentially different styles along the way as well. We're quite excited to explore that. But 
yeah, for now we we've got this really super slick uh, minimum pair of uh, minimum pair of glasses that we're working on. We hope to if you follow the um, the ID mechanical channel, I'll share little CAD renderings and sketches as we develop the product um, along and little prototypes as well. So um, yeah, uh, we hope to to build this along on Discord and, and share our development process with you guys. So that's brain. Yeah, and I don't want to sound dramatic, but like we've been working on this thing for a little while now and it is just beautiful. Even just when you hold it up like this, that it's just mm -hmm. it is it's amazing. We yeah, well I mean we're so excited because it's a lot different from other products on the market it's it's a very different direction in terms of size and shape and weight it currently weighs i think 35 grams um and that's weighted in with the batteries uh, and the mm -hmm. hardware there's a few little sort of structural elements in there and the lenses themselves so it's super light it's super lightweight um i want to let raj Maybe you want mm. to say a few words about what's under the hood and yep. you know the platform. Yeah, that, definitely. That we'll this thing. So um, yeah, there's a question here. Do we have a, a working working version? And uh, we sort of do, um, but we're we're waiting for the new boards to arrive. So those have been ordered um, a few weeks ago now. So yeah, we're just waiting for these new boards to show up. Um, previously we had sort of the basics up and running and, um, but the, the first iteration was, it was incredibly complicated as from a system perspective. Uh, the, the electronics were spread out across a PCB, two FPCs, uh, the camera was like going through a connector on an FPC and folding around. Um, and we really sort of tried to, yeah, that's, that's the working version. Um, but that this sort of thing is, is very difficult to actually really assemble. Uh, so in the new version, we've, we've really sort of condensed everything down onto an even smaller PCB. Um, the camera is a tiny little camera in the middle that's mounted directly on the board. Um, uh, the antenna come, you know, just sort of goes down along here. Um, and so we're really trying to simplify the electronics. So we have we have a working version, but in a few weeks we should have an even better working version. So yeah, when the boards arrive, I will uh, I'll drop a picture of them in in Discord so you guys can have a look. They should look really nice. Yeah, they're super small, mm -hmm. super tiny. Yep. I, I, this has been asked a lot. Uh, IMU in yep. there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, has an IMU, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was one thing much requested on monocle so yeah this this one has an imu um it's still i mean some of these components are still kind of evolving uh and right now we've gone for an imu that is in stock uh there's there's some great imus out there but they're impossible to get hold of right now so uh, right now we've got a three axis compass and a three axis accelerometer um and the sort of reason to go with the compass over over uh, like a six axis accelerometer gyro um, is that it'd be nice to sort of know if you're if you're using sort of like a navigation type thing a navigation application to know exactly which way you're facing in the real world um, but i would like to find a nine axis get that get the gyro in there uh, and then you can really try and lock things to the environment um, that'd be really nice um but yeah just need to need to find a device that that fits the small enough um meets all the requirements for power that we want um and is in stock so still still on the hunt for parts if anyone finds anything drop it in the discord i'm gonna have a look <laughs> um yeah. but yeah this is the imu is is in there uh but it'll, it'll probably it will probably uh, bump it up when we can when we find something that's in stock getting closer to closer to production All right. To those who might have just joined, welcome to the AMA. We're talking about monocle. We're talking about frame, and um, we welcome any of your questions. Right? Mm -hmm. Question about buck graphics. Yes. You want to take that, Raj. Yep. So, 
yeah, one like a nice way to think about this whole MicroPython thing. Um, MicroPython on Monocle and Frame is intended to be that network interface, the way you communicate to the device and the way you tell it to do stuff. What the FPGA runs is completely up to you. Uh, you can build any FPGA application using the GoWin tools um, or using StreamLogic, which you might have heard about in, in the FPGA channel. Um, and the idea is that we want to actually let you sort of on the fly switch out that binary to do whatever you want. Uh, and that could be some kind of computer vision thing, um, doing some kind of recognition using the cameras, detecting QR codes, um, playing games, could be whatever. Um, but the MicroPython is there to let you switch that in and out and then drive it. So we have we have the bindings in place which let you communicate to the FPGA over SPI, read and write to registers, i.e. tell the FPGA application what it should do. Um, and so then, you know, the, the sky becomes a limit. So we really want to keep the MicroPython part just that sort of network level for the the... the uh, sort of wider world to access the thing running on the FPGA, um, but still giving you like some some capability to do logic, uh, to to handle power, to get low power, you know, to turn the FPGA off if you need to save battery and then bring it up again in a good way, um, then all these kinds of things. So just sort of taking that paradigm, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of options for what IP you could have on the FPGA. Um, Stream Logic, when it when you when it's finally released, there's a lot of cool features in there for um, computer vision uh, and machine learning applications. So it's all a drag and drop interface, um, and uh, just FPGA in development in general is starting to become more accessible. So you can also think of Monocle and later on Frame as sort of a wireless FPGA dev kit. So previously, you'd have to have like some board, plug in some cable, install a ton of stuff, uh, spend ages getting it working, um, making a custom board is a whole nother thing. Um, but this is designed to be that wireless FPGA dev platform um, that you can start making very, very nice and custom apps on. And as Raj, going back to an early question about uh, expanding the target audience beyond hackers, the drag and drop that you talked about, how mm -hmm. drag and drop <laughs> for someone like yep. me who's a, just a designer? Yeah, so it's um, it's probably somewhere between uh, if if some of the some of the people in the chat might be familiar with. Um, uh, for example, the BBC, what's it called? The BBC Microbit. Uh, this is a development um, board designed for kids. So it's specifically targeted for schools. And uh, it uses, uh, Microsoft has actually developed uh, a whole web application that is drag and drop puzzle pieces. They look like these little puzzle pieces. And you can nest them together and one says loop. And then you can say how many times. And then in there you can say... Uh, you know, you can line up a bunch of blocks, play sound, show this on the LEDs, and then do this, and then it loops. So it becomes very visual and intuitive. So Stream Logic is a little bit like that, but still caters to the advanced user. So you can you can sort of look at things and sort of intuitively figure out what they mean, um, and uh, build things that way. So you don't really need to know how all the Verilog and all all the RTL generation is happening under the hood. Uh, it takes care of all of that for you. Um, you just need to sort of understand the logic of what you're building. And that is is very intuitive for people. If you don't have a programming background, um, I think generally people are quite surprised how, how easy it is to do. Um, but it is still it's still designed to be a professional professional tool. So you, you won't be limited in that regard. Awesome. Um, Joshua has provided a very helpful link to yeah, uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. Make Code. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, and yeah, shout out to MEH301 or Meh301, who uh, before that, uh, I think, said the production is returning for uh, for an IMU and that there's some in stock. Awesome. So mm -hmm. thank you. And nice. yeah, we'll definitely we'll check, check that, that one out. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with right. regards to prescription glasses, 
um, there's a question at the bottom, um, prescription glasses. Um, so currently, um, though the lenses that you see um, with the prism in on, on freight, they won't, won't be available with prescription lenses. It's the, um, processing the, the optics is, is quite difficult and we need a, like a flat surface on the front of the back. But we are exploring ideas where prescription lenses could be placed in front of, of those of those lenses on on the on the glasses um so yeah that's something we're exploring but not within those uh, the sort of the confines of the, of the lens that you see there and the battery size is um double from monocle it's the t it's two of the 70 milliamp hour batteries that we we currently mm. use at monocle mm. and they go behind the ear so in the prototype you can see the sort of thing on the end that's where the batteries live So I, you know, we, we envision Monocle and Frame living together as kind of sibling devices. So Monocle will always be this, you know, little pocket size clip-on device. Um, and so if you wear glasses like I do, then that's kind of an obvious go-to. Um, but Frame will be available for people who don't wear glasses. Um, that being said, I can wear a uh, Frame over my glasses and... Uh, it doesn't look too goofy, uh, believe it or not. And, you know, it's able to actually kind of hug my ears uh, such that it doesn't feel like it's about to fall off. So, um, you know, for what it's worth, for those who want to give that a try, I, I can do it and, and it works out for me. But, but that's everyone's call. Mm -hmm. There's a question so, of... Uh, will this if, have... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go yep. for it. Go for it. Will right. will uh, will this have improved hardware slash software where you can save programs? Um, so Monocle will will eventually include this uh, this saving ability, um, and uh, Frame is basically it's is designed on more or less the same idea. So very similar architecture. Um, we are playing around with different different devices that will power it. Um, so one thing we'd like to do is add Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth. So we've been looking at the ESPs to actually um, be the main processor um, and also looking at other options for um, for FPGAs. So uh, it's still all a work in progress uh, and the, the memory and these kinds of things. Um, again, it's going to be sort of in the ballpark of what Monocle already has. Um, we want to uh, aim for more RAM. Um, so we'll see if we can we can add that, um, and yeah. So the idea is that it's it's more or less they're more or less compatible. So uh, your your MicroPython applications that you run for Frame uh, can also work on Monocle. So there might be some small differences, but we really want to try and keep the APIs there exactly the same, all the module definitions. Um, so you can run on either. And eventually, to just bring both both these product lines to be exactly the same hardware, just different form factors. So I think that'll be that'll be nice to have. So then you're not really compromising which direction you go. Then there's a question on uh, if the battery dies on Monocle, can it be fixed? Um, so the way the way the actual battery is attached inside Monocle, it's not removable. Um, but if you're good at soldering, it's just two pins. It's a through hole, uh, through hole part, um, and it's fairly easy to to desolder. Um, and we had to go with a soldered on soldered on battery essentially, um, just because of the size constraint. It's so it's so packed in there, uh, and there's no other way to sort of make a mechanism where you can kind of take it in and out. Um, but it's sort of this halfway. So while we haven't taken monocle and glued everything together that you can't take it apart. Uh, we've still designed it that you can unscrew it, take the back off um, very carefully, you know, take off the ribbon cables and then get the main board out and then you can switch the battery uh, as long as you're, as long as you're uh, decent at soldering. Yeah, and I think we will do a disassembly video, right, at some point mm -hmm. Yep. To, to help with that because yep. um, it's, it's really the ribbon cables that are a bit tricky when you pull the mm -hmm. back off. Yep. Yep. Um, and then Simone's question over here, frame oh. has Wi-Fi? 
So at the moment, it has Wi-Fi. So uh, um, for now, it seems like we'll, we'll be sticking to Wi-Fi. Uh, and so it has Bluetooth as well. Yeah, and I'm wondering, Raj, before we go off to a different mm -hmm. question, um, the, so you mentioned it before that was raised again here, the notion of persistence um, mm -hmm. and that it's in the development kind of timeline, yep. it's in the backlog, but yep. but not yet. Do you want to just speak a little bit more mm. to a rough timeline around that just so that people have yeah. a sense of when it's coming? Yeah, absolutely. So um, at the moment, we're, we're getting the, the persistence of the FPGA application on there. So uh, Monocle ships with a, um, a very basic FPGA application uh, that just lets you drive the display, read out the camera and these kinds of things. Uh, but we want to soon start upgrading that that image. Um, so to do that, we actually have to make the mechanism that will transfer uh, a new FPGA image and save it into the flash chip on Monocle. And then the FPGA will start booting from that every time it turns on, every time you take it out of the case. Uh, that's the early beginnings of the flash driver that will run the file system to host these uh, Python scripts. Um, right now, uh, the standard MicroPython firmware expects this file system to be in the same flash region as the rest of uh, as the rest of the firmware. Um, so we need to take that take that module um, and actually just redirect uh, all the flash calls to the offboard flash. Uh, so right now we haven't looked at um, what work is involved, uh, but in principle it shouldn't be too complicated. Uh, so the plan is to get um, the FPGA bootloading working, um, add the few things we need inside the REPL to actually let you do that update. We also want to build some kind of editor, uh, like a code editor, that lets you write out these scripts and then save it. So that needs to come into the web REPL. Uh, and in parallel of that, we will start working on um, the actual mechanism that will save these Python scripts in a persistent way on Monocle. Um, so it's, you know, I'd probably give it like um, sometime end of March, we'll start playing around with this, seeing how it's going. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give you updates then. So once it gets in the pipeline, I mean, it's, it's, you know, two, three weeks worth of work probably. Um, but that's roughly when we're planning to to start going on that is some sometime towards the end of March. Yeah, we're, we're doing updates right now in Discord. Um, there's like an updates channel you guys might have noticed um, and and we'll try to update more frequently as well. Yeah. Um, but we can explore email if, if folks prefer that to Discord or we can kind mm -hmm. of do that alongside Discord as well. Um, we definitely, for those who bought Monocle, we're definitely sending emails out when it's arriving, but also things that you should do, like update the firmware when it arrives. So, you know, we are in touch with, with people who are imminently receiving a Monocle. Um, but, uh, but we'll definitely be updating uh, about this stuff in Discord. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a question, um, there was a question up above, Roger, about you would need a new device to get that feature. Do you want to um, speak to that? Just seeing which one that is. Yeah, about persistence. A new device. No, so the the monocle will will as a firmware update enable this functionality. So you don't need to yeah. buy a new device. Um, so. It will. It's just uh, something we've got to add into the firmware. And um, so the mechanisms are there. We just haven't gotten around to enabling things. Uh, and you'll notice that with a lot of lot of things in the firmware, there, there might be bits missing here and there. Um, if you read our docs, you might see little crosses next to some of the some of the function calls. And it's just because we haven't finished building them yet. Um, so we have a rough priority of what needs to be done when. Uh, but as time goes on, right now we're, we're still getting sort of like the basics of like the Bluetooth communication for sending files across um, now that the REPL's all working um, and getting the storage stuff working, then the flash driver working. 
Um, so all of these things are at the moment still being worked on on sort of a low level. Um, but we expect every week or every two weeks that you'll get a firmware update notification uh, and then get new features with it. Uh, regarding how you will know about firmware updates, uh, this is the great thing about having sort of this, this web application that is actually sending stuff uh, every time you connect to Monocle. So as soon as you actually turn on your Monocle and you connect to the, the web app, uh, the web REPL, you get a notification on the screen or Monocle saying new firmware available. And then you can click on a button inside the web REPL and it updates your firmware. So we'll, every time there's a new update, as soon as you take Monocle out and put it on, you'll get that. You'll get that thing. So if you don't want to update the firmware, you just use Monocle as it is. Um, but if you do, you hit that button and you'll get the update. And then JCUN asked earlier about whether this is our full-time thing or whether we're going to disappear one day. Um, so yes, this is our full-time thing. Yep. Um, and we've worked very hard on it. We're venture funded as a company. So, um, you know, we, we have shareholders who would also not want us to disappear one day. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, but the other, the other good thing about this being an open source, uh, project is that, you know, it will, it will live on. I mean, my, my hope for it, at least, you know, like a child, right. Is that like, it lives on, you know, even, even if you need to go do something else. Uh, for a while. So, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, there will be a community around it who ideally would continue working on it, shipping updates to it. Um, but for, for the meantime, you know, this is very much, this is our baby. This is our first device and, um, we're, we're, we're here to make it happen. Don't worry. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. All right, more questions, more questions. I think we're just at the top of the hour here. So, you know, keep it coming. We can, we can hang out for like another 15 minutes or something. And then I got to go catch a flight, but, but this is fun. And we're going to do these AMAs like on a regular basis. So yeah, especially as more people. Yeah. Yeah. So as more people are coming into the community and, and ordering devices and, you know, thinking of ideas to build for it. We, we want to be available to you guys. So, um, you know, count on this as being a regular thing. Uh -huh. I've seen the question. So this is from Joshua. I've seen the question around the reason for a patent in the enclosure coming around the community a couple of times. So yeah, I think I've seen this too. So um, if I'm thinking of the right question, it goes something like, if this is an open source project, isn't it? Uh, uh, paradoxical, or isn't it a bit of a conflict that you guys have patented? Is, is that more or less kind of the, the tenor of the question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, it is actually quite the opposite. And the reason I'll mention that is we're living in a world where I'm not going to get too philosophical, but we're living in a world, fortunately, um, the systems that govern invention, namely the intellectual property system is is very much weaponized against people who want to do cool projects uh like like this so i'll run the scenario where we build monocle we launch monocle into the world and um someone you know it could be a patent lawyer uh, who has no intention of ever making this device um, or building a company around it but just has the legal background to be able to write some words, draw some things, um, and patent what we ourselves have built. Suddenly that would prevent us from not just making and selling the device, but uh, it, would, it would force people who are buying it and using it to then pay royalties or be beholden to the patent holder. So, and that patent holder likely would not have the intention that we have where we're putting it on an MIT open source license. So in other words, us patenting this is actually a protection. So the patent plus the open source license is a protection for our community to be able to 
apply and use and like track and develop for this thing in a way that they know will not leave them vulnerable to someone else who might come along and say, hey, it seems like a fun open source project. I've got the patent for it now. And now all y'all got to pay me something. So, um, you know, this is this is uh, this is actually not, not a contradiction. It's actually a form of protection for everyone. So, you know, not to get too legally on everyone here, but um, unfortunately, that's the world we're living in. Yep. Um, and that's that's how we think about patent. Mm. Yep. And to add to uh, Joshua's Joshua's uh, um, point just here, um, so the open source licenses apply to uh, the code. Um, so we have the ISC license, which covers all of the, the C code. Um, we have, uh, I think you have to check the, the other license that we have for the RTL and um, uh, the schematics. So they're all, they're all written on there. But the pattern really mainly covers the optic design uh, and the housing and the industrial design. So that's, that's the bit that we had to really protect is that physical in the physical part. So all of these licenses and the pattern, yeah. that's also protecting this. Exactly. Yeah, uh, you know, code, for better or worse, code can't be patented. So yeah, the license might cover that. But then again, to write for something, you need the physical device and the patent does cover the physical device. So we, we kind of have to do both. Good question. Um, what else, folks? What else can we answer? All right, we got a new question coming. was a good preamble yeah because now now we know what to say <laughs> how hard is it well do your own homework <laughs> um yeah rod maybe you want yeah. to take this one so this is um this is a good question to actually ask uh, scott in the fpga stream logic chat so he's our he's mm. our fpga guy um and He's, uh, he's, he's fairly experienced in actually building these kinds of models and deploying them onto FPGAs. Um, so it's a great question to ask him. Um, and I think as, as we get closer to actually, so he's right now he's actually working on getting his uh, StreamLogic platform um, working with Monocle. And uh, I think once that's done, there'll be some examples and demos ready. So that's a uh, that's good, good place to reach out to him. Um, and keep an eye on that channel. Um, so he mentioned uh, some examples, um, I think during last week. Um, and I think one example he had, if you want to do uh, face detection, uh, that's very possible. Um, sort of to detect sort of like a very broad idea of, you know, what you want to see, like people detection, face detection. Um, but it won't be detecting specific people. Um, so that's the sort of level of the complexity of the model you'd be looking at. Um, so understanding that's a person, that's not a person. That can that, that's the sort of level we can we can run on the FPGA. And uh, another way to sort of think about how um, how these models, you know, what kind of model should you deploy onto Monocle? Um, a nice way of thinking about sort of this the you from a user experience perspective. If you imagine the scenario where you have a device um, with an FPGA, that's the fastest way on device is to do some kind of inferencing. Uh, if you want to know something very quickly, you do it on the device. If you want to add a bit more complexity, um, but you don't mind waiting a little bit, you can do it on the mobile phone. If you want even more complexity, uh, that takes the, the most power, but it'll take the longest, then you have to reach out to the cloud. So you've got these three stages on device, on the um, sort of intermediate device, like a gateway or a mobile device uh, or the cloud. If you start combining these three, you can make a very smooth user experience. 
For example, if you want to make an application that recognizes uh, something on the street and tells you information about it. Well, the first part of the model could be running on the FPGA, and that just gives you a rough idea of what that is. It can say that's a car, and maybe it comes up with a box that says car. And then at the same time, it's querying the mobile device to say, what car is this? Give me some more sort of information. And then you see a little bit of information or sort of like a subheading pop below. During this time, it's already reached out to the cloud. And maybe that's taken several seconds. And by the time you've seen the title, the subheading, then you get the Wikipedia article. So that's how you get this smooth UX. Really try and think about splitting your model up across where it makes sense um, and tying those together in a good way. Yeah, it's a good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this hand control uh, point to menu. Um, I think Simone has been, you've been working on that one. Uh, so there's some, there's some good demos there. Um, again, I think Scott will have some, some great ideas on, on this one. Um, yeah, that's definitely exciting to see, to see these sort of applications building in the chat channels. So yeah, really mm. keen to see, see how you guys get on. Yeah, I know Simone has been working on the, a pretty neat gesture recognition uh, module. So, then mm -hmm. yeah, push notifications and the dock. That would be really cool to see. Mm -hmm. um, push notifications. I mean, unsurprisingly, we get we get a lot of like requests for things like that. So, um, that would be pretty hotly used, I think, uh, if you were to develop that. Push notifications are a bit interesting because um, uh, Apple and Google, or on Android, they do them in slightly different ways. Um, so Apple actually have a Bluetooth service called the notification, Apple notification service, that is actually built to deliver all different kinds of push notifications. Um, but since I've, I've been following this for a long time, I used to work with building smartwatches, um, consumer smartwatches back in the day. And uh, you could see that every so often they'd chop away a feature, they'd chop away a feature, they'd chop away a feature. And it's really this idea is that why are they allowing all the notifications going to someone else's smartwatch rather than an Apple Watch? And so the limitations start showing up. Um, on Android, it's a lot more flexible, but it works in a completely different way. They have a completely different kind of notification service. Um, so you end up in this territory of what works on one thing doesn't work on another thing and uh, it really comes down to what you want to build are you building it just for yourself um, for a specific target of people or are you trying to make something generic uh, and that's why we haven't implemented the any of the push notification services ourselves um, because there's a there's a huge broad scope on what what you need to do and also supporting that because sometimes things change question about um, FPS via Bluetooth. Um, that's really hard to, to answer actually, because we still haven't tried it. Um, it will require some kind of uh, decoder. Um, so there's, there's two, two sort of directions. One is um, actually delivering the camera stream or the camera image uh, from Monocle to uh, a mobile phone over Bluetooth. Um, and then there's the other direction of delivering something from a phone to the display. Um, in both directions, we have some form of compression. So the camera supports native uh, JPEG compression, uh, and you can adjust the, the compression there. Uh, and there's no bottleneck really on the, the delivery of um, that JPEG image to the Nordic MCU. The bottleneck becomes over Bluetooth. Uh, and right now we have, um, we're using the one megabit um, uh, Bluetooth speed, but in reality that drops off quite quickly as soon as you start moving further from the device. Um, so you'll notice that, for example, when you do a firmware update, 
the firmware update shows you the, the speed of the update. And as you move the phone further away, you see it start dropping off. Um, and at the moment, it's um, it's in the, you know, something you get something like four, five, six kilobyte, uh, kilobytes per second. Um, so that's sort of what, um, or might be kilobits per second. You can, you can see when you're actually doing an update, um, the rate there. So that's sort of your bandwidth. Uh, and that's running over Bluetooth, just standard Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth low energy services and characteristics. Um, there is a way to get faster uh, Bluetooth transfer, but that would basically be a completely custom firmware um, that uses, um, that's another, it's another Bluetooth protocol, um, but that wouldn't be compatible, for example, with the web Bluetooth API that we use for the REPL. So there's a whole, you know, you can really go into diving into sort of speeding it up and uh, really pushing the limits on Bluetooth. Um, but the DFU gives you a good idea of what that, what that bandwidth is like. Same goes in the other direction. So we can, you can take some kind of compressed uh, video stream and deliver it to be played on the display. Uh, but you just got to keep in mind what kind of decoder the FPGA could support. Uh, and uh, Scott actually mentioned in, in the chat last week um, that um, MPEG-2 is, uh, is an example of what, what we could support there um, because there's not enough memory to really buffer something like H.264 um, to actually decode that kind of stream. You need to buffer uh, a lot of data to, to actually do that. So. Custom resolutions are... Of, uh, possible as well. So actually, this is this is what um, Joshua is working on right now. And um, uh, the the camera is able to deliver um, different resolutions. So anywhere from five megapixels, which is the native resolution of the camera. Uh, and then you can have different options, which drop down to smaller and smaller sizes. Um, and yeah, these will all affect all affect the sort of uh, final image size that you're transferring. Uh, on the direction of phone to the display, um, that's 640 by 400. But again, you could scale that if you wanted to. Um, so there's some options there. And yeah, if you, if you don't need it to be real time, um, there is uh, there is RAM. Uh, on board uh, that's attached to the FPGA. So that's actually what we do now um, in this in this replay feature where you can enable replay and uh, the memory just buffers the last, I think it's four seconds of video. Um, we've just hard coded the, the particular resolution at the moment. Um, so it records four seconds uh, and then it plays that back onto the display. You could just take, read out that data and send it to the phone. Uh, right now, the standard, the basic image that Monocle ships with doesn't include this, um, but uh, later on we can upgrade the FPGA um, binary to include something like this, um, or you can build a, a custom custom application on the FPGA that does exactly that. Right, so we're at uh, five fifteen a.m. my time. Um, yeah. Super in the mo early in the morning nice for you guys. Bright and early, um, <laughs> but I want to see if there's any final questions from the uh, folks before we call it a. Most of you not in the U.S. Yeah, actually, none of the three of us are in the U.S. So, I'm from the U.S. Um, shout out to Philadelphia. Sad year for us, but uh, because of our Eagles. But uh, but shout out to Philly. Um, Raj is from the UK, but lives in Sweden, and Benjamin is also from the UK, but lives in Shanghai. So none of us are in our native countries. Mm. But, yeah. uh, I think we cover like six time world. zones. The whole team. Everyone's in different places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Sylvie, who some of you might have been in touch with in Discord, for any like, yeah, let me give her a shout out first of all because she's been doing some really great work. Um, just just trying to make sure everyone is receiving their monocles or you know getting order confirmations because there was a hiccup there, um, which should be fixed by now. But um, Sylvie is in New York City, so uh, for those of you in the U.S., she shares more or less shares the time zone with you guys. But um, but yeah, me, Ben, and Roger are not in the U.S. All right, Simone asks, I have seen the resolution GLB in the FPGA repo. Mm -hmm. Is it as simple as changing the global one or breaking everything? That will break everything. Um, so there's several settings there's that you'll have to change. Um, and you'll also have to change uh, the resolution that is being fed to the camera. Uh, so the actual configuration of the camera is done by the Nordic MCU and the data of the camera goes into the FPGA. So the, the MCU configures the camera and you can change that whenever you want as MicroPython commands. Um, but at the moment, we haven't finished putting all of those, uh, all of those um, bindings in yet. So right now, Joshua is working on a uh, camera.zoom function, which will actually scale, it will actually take the, the, the um, uh, image the, the camera is capturing scale it and then output, uh, I think it's 640 by 400 to the FPGA. And we can also change the output. So there's different resolution for how, what you want to capture. It gets um, scaled by the camera natively into another resolution, which goes to the FPGA. And that's the global that you see. Um, and then that can then be transferred over SPI to the Nordic chip out via Bluetooth. So there's a few things you have to change there. So we're gonna we're gonna add um, settings for this. So you'll be able to change the camera uh, format. So right now it's outputting raw uh, data to the FPGA. That's really good for machine learning applications um, and running neural networks that actually freaking, you know, they need the pixel data. Uh, but you can also output JPEG images, which are smaller, but not very good for the FPGA to do anything with. Um, so we're going to have an option for that. And then we'll also have an option to change the output resolution as well as the viewing resolution. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff coming on the camera, camera side. Yeah, and again, so we want to make this tunable. So you can, you can choose what sort of uh, quality you want. You can change the JPEG quality. You can change the resolution. That will that will also come. So if I was to give a time frame to all this, um, you know, because we've talked about a couple things here, mm -hmm. and like as you guys can tell, there's a ton of work happening behind the scenes right now to ship a lot of this stuff. So yep. March is going to be a big month for us. Um, you know, all this camera stuff mm -hmm. being able to run persistent apps. Um, Scott on the stream logic side, so on kind of the drag and drop FPGA side of things, um, which includes a really powerful graphics engine and, and eventually some compression. He's going to have a few milestone releases, one at the end of Feb, and then I think one or two over March. So mm -hmm. March is going to be a really, really big month for us. Yep. And all of this, you know, to speak to an earlier question, uh, none of this will necessitate buying a new device. All this is over the air upgradable. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. you just a couple taps and, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. That's, a question. That's a really good question. Yeah, that's a good name. Yep. Yep. So, right now, uh, Monocle is a Bluetooth peripheral, um, but the Nordic chip supports it to be a central device as well. So it is possible to connect peripheral devices to Monocle, um, but we haven't actually built that in yet. So it requires some some adjustments on the firmware. Um, yeah, and it's something we can we can definitely put on our uh, on the pipe in the pipeline. Uh, I think it'd be a really neat feature to have to be able to have like different kinds of controllers that you can can interact with Monocle. Um, so, yep, that'd be really useful. Um, but at the moment, it's uh, it's just a uh, just a peripheral. So 
that's uh, yeah something something we want to put in the in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your point, Simone, it is fun to have so many challenges. Um, I think that's a really smart way to look at it. It, it means it's uncharted territory, and in many ways it is, both in terms of how you experience the thing in front of your eye, but also just um, novel relationships between devices in your life. Uh, that hasn't been done very well yet. Mm. And I think um, one of the reasons for that, there's a bunch. One is there's, uh, it, there's been a lack of a central controller and the phone is not the obvious or intuitive choice for that. So um, my hypothesis is that it's a heads up display, that that is a more intuitive central controller for the devices in your life. Um, and so I think figuring a lot of this stuff out is, uh, is uncharted territory. Um, and the pipeline, there is a pipeline of sorts, right? In the documentation page. Uh, I don't think there is at the moment. Um, okay. you, but yeah, that's a that's a nice system. nice feature to add. Um, camera uh, display dot screenshot or something would be a really really cool idea. Yep, I will uh, throw that. Make a note for that one. Mm, with display overlay. Mm. That could be really nice to have. I mean, to the second part of your question just now too all this goes without saying that because it's an open source project you know anyone can fork the code and mm. like if you wanted to do the screenshot as uh, something that you contribute either for your own you know, mm. thing or contributing to the rest of the community to make use of um then like that's totally something that you could do as well yeah. so our hope is that in addition to our own central roadmap of development other people who have you know, the, the skills and mm. the inspiration can similarly build and contribute stuff. Um, and, you know, we haven't talked much about it on this call, but we have plans to, to do um, like app or even like script distribution mm. within our um, within our app. So if you build something for notifications, we want to make it as easy for someone to discover and update their own monocle with your code uh, with like a tap or two, um, and then uh, you know uh, there'll, there'll be some monetization on that for people to develop as well. So. <laughs> yeah. And yes, malicious intent. That's true. The ever present malicious intent. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe we'll hang out for one last question. Last call, and then uh, I think it's been close to an hour and a half, so we can wrap it up after mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Favorite color? Black. <laughs> <laughs> What is, is the, the next, next event? event? That's a good last <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, we don't know yet, but mm. there will be one. We'll try to keep it pretty frequent, right? That's our, mm. our aim. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, something like two weeks from now, I would say. Yeah. Mm. It'll yeah. either be internal on, like, on our own Discord, or it'll be on an external platform. Um, I think Roger's doing uh, a hack chat soon. Um, so uh, that's on Hackaday, right, Raj? Yep. It's on Hackster. Yep, Hackaday. It's on Hackaday. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, definitely uh, tune in for that. But, um, but you know, let's give it two weeks. We haven't put something in the calendar yet, but uh, something like that. All right. Mm. Oh, Baltic Whale. I see Baltic Whale is typing. Let's see what... We'll make this the last one. Yeah. Oh, see what I snuck in there. It's okay, Baltic Whale will still answer your question too. What do you think of Telegram to share videos with more than eight megabytes? 
Have we updated this now? Because the Discord, I think, has a we 50 have. meg. Yeah. Um, we've upgraded our Discord, so uh, you can test it, Simone, and you should be able to share videos, uh, larger videos. But let me know if you can. Yeah, that's useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like Telegram. But, uh, it's like a very Web3 thing currently. Not not exclusively, of course. People use Telegram for a lot of stuff, but like a very Web3 thing. But I just like how it feels. Like the chat app, it feels very like, mm -hmm. like there's like, I don't know, at least on my phone, there's good haptics around how mm -hmm. you interact with everything. So it feels very springy. All right, Baltic Whale, hammering out what promises to be a great question. <laughs> Suspense. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for showing up. Thanks for so many great questions. This was, uh, I mean, it's great. Like again, we want to do this on a, you know, pretty mm. regular basis. So, yeah. Cat on the keyboard. <laughs> that was just previous fun. All right. Uh, finger, fingers crossed for development. Thank you. Us as well. Okay. Why is the current design superior to one that has simply a beam splitter glass mirror? I'm getting optics here. As the mirror for the display and have the display to be placed further up in the PCB, relocating the battery in there increasing display distance and making room for a lens. Making room for a lens. It's a good question. I appreciate the question. Actually, I wish we had more questions about optics and mechanical. Um, yeah. What would the lens be used for? Yeah, but I'm not sure I understand. If I, uh, if I remember the sketch correctly, the the display was at the top of monocle, and it would it would go down, to give like a longer distance, right? That was the that was the main difference. Yeah, I mean, so uh, one thing that I, you know, and okay, the lens would be used to make the image clearer. So, okay, right, you want to put a little kind of optical element in there. Um, to clarify the image. So one thing that I think I appreciate about, about this is that the lens wouldn't necessarily make the image clearer. You could use an, a lens to magnify an image, but it wouldn't lend clarity to the image per se. Um, so that's kind of one. We did look at adding a little optical element uh, a while back, right below the display, all right. within the top housing. So the display would be a little higher would be a little optical lens, a little element right below it, and then that would magnify things right out of the uh, that yeah, box, I out of the display. I believe it would improve the display, the, the, the image that you see, that, that kind of method. Yeah. Um, um, you know, so uh, decreasing distance between eye and display by using a lens. Um, Yeah, and so actually, so raising the display, one reason we didn't do it that way, uh, not just because of mechanical considerations, you know, like battery and all that, but yeah, thanks for that diagram. Okay. That actually increases the distance between display and, and that spherical mirror on the very bottom, which actually does a couple of negative things as I, as I uh, understand. One is, of course, it leaves it open for more um, light loss because the further distance light needs to travel from that display, the more opportunity there is for light to be lost in the process and it, it, it loses light fast. So, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's kind of one reason we want to keep the display mounted directly on the prism as close to that bottom mirror as possible. Um, but the second is um, it actually means that uh, the image quality is also reduced 
because the, the rays, as you have here in the diagram, um, in actuality, it's actually, it's very messy, the ways that the RGB rays kind of fire out from the display. Um, and it, you know, if, if they fire out too far, it can be hard to kind of capture and collimate them to be focused yeah. back up toward that central beam splitter and then out to your eye from there. So um, lowering the distance or reducing the distance actually means that mm. the, the lower mirror is able to capture more of the rays that fire out from the display um, and then redirect them upward. So you're losing yeah. less light and you're actually increasing the quality of your image because mm. you're capturing more of the RGB coming out of the display. So that's what, I mean, it's those two things paired with uh, mechanical considerations, just it's, you know, kind of tight up in the, the, the top housing there. Mm. Um, we need to get a battery in there. Fortunately, that battery kind of blocks a lot of the display. Mm -hmm. Paul Quail's like, all right, wrap it up, I get yeah. it. Um, <laughs> you're yeah. welcome. So that, that, that's kind of the, the short or long answer. The thing I found yeah, really interesting about... As well. Mm. Something I find really interesting about the the optics. So the the Joya guys who are in the in the Discord as well um, helped us out on the display uh, on the optics. Um, you know they they're like the sort of the ones who know the the detailed physics behind how all of this works and all the trade offs. It's really interesting seeing how there there's all these little wheels that you can turn that if you you change that parameter you you affect this. You change that parameter, you affect this, and there's so many things to think about. You know how uh, it, it sort of clarity doesn't mean anything on its own, but it's like you know you have these fringing effects. Um, you know the the differences in uh, uh, color, the differences in intensity, um, these kind of mm. waves that you get in the image, all these kinds of things, and there's so many like subtle tweaks that they talk about. And, you know, early on, I remember seeing even for frame, like these diagrams of like, uh, we change this and you get these patterns, you change this and you get that, you change this and all these different options. And they say, choose your, you know, your mix and match how you want it to be. And uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of parameters in this thing. Um, so it's, it's really a case of like sim keeping it simple as possible. Uh, to avoid having too many of these dials to play with, uh, in a way. Otherwise, it can you can end up just sort of tweaking things forever and uh, making things yeah. harder. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I'm just trying to find an image of uh, like those rays, like the optical mm. designs. Um, I will share one to the optics channel when I find one, just because it might be interesting for, for people to see. But yeah, I mean, glad that you mentioned There's one here from the back, actually, from the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can show that in. Joya is a, like a fountain of knowledge. So um, they're, they're standing by in the optics channel, if you guys want to query them um, and ask about this stuff as well, because those guys are amazing and they're doing all the optical design for frame. Yeah, and it's kind of that side profile that you're looking at there that, that um, is one of the driving factors of the FOV size. So to, to keep it to the size that we want, um, yeah, we'd, we'd have to make the uh, the optics bigger. Yeah. Did we miss a question? I'm just looking right. for it. Yeah. Something about an SDK. Maybe you can drop the question, copy paste it in again. Mm -hmm. Oh, the January. It's the older AMA. It's the last ah, AMA. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ah, what SDK integrations will this support? Um, so, at the moment, I mean, we have uh, so we have this sort of stream logic. Um, thing that is we're, we're targeting towards the FPGA and then MicroPython and everything MicroPython supports internally um, on the NRF. So on both those SDKs uh, you can say that there's a whole bunch of switches in there that you can enable certain features, disable certain features depending what you want. 
if you want to sort of tweak those things. Um, but then how Monocle reaches out to the wider world, it's really up to you. So, I mean, the, the interface to Monocle is Python strings over, over Bluetooth, two Bluetooth characteristics. Um, so how that interacts with the wider world is, is up to your app design that runs on the phone or a PC app or gateway. And we will have our web REPL where we keep adding these sorts of things. Uh, and one sort of idea we have is to enable um, things like post requests and get uh, that you can actually connect to a server, get some information uh, and, and send things out, out to the internet. Um, so that's one thing we want to add in there. Um, but aside from that, it's, it's fairly open to ideas. Um, but yeah, what kind of things you want to add, you're, you're very free to do so. Um, because that's that's the whole idea of using Python as this network interface, so that it's it's easy to build um, integrations to whatever you like. You don't have to learn complicated specs on um, you know payload formats and how to communicate to it and all these things. Um, it really just comes down to Python strings. I, that's the ideal ideal scenario. Um, so it might not work for every case, but that's what we're, we're aiming for. All right. I think we'll, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, right. So looking for the last AMA should be up on YouTube. Um, I'll have, um, I'll have someone share it into the, the general chat after this, um, or maybe Simone, if you're able to, to get a, a link you can share it as well um but this has also been recorded this will also be shared up for posterity mm -hmm. and um we'll be doing this again like probably in a couple weeks from now so thank you guys yep there's the there's the youtube oh, video. Yeah. yeah um awesome questions and it's always such a pleasure to interact with you guys and just hear about what you're thinking of building um so stay tuned there's exciting stuff coming and uh, we'll keep the chat going in Discord. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Bye, everyone. Catch you hey. guys later on. Bye. See ya. See you later.